In a previous video, we learned that many limits can be found using direct substitution. In this video, we will begin to explore what techniques we can use when direct substitution is not possible. Let's start off by examining two techniques, dividing out and rationalizing. Let's start by seeing why direct substitution will not help us find the limit. So for direct substitution, we would take this negative three and substitute it for all the x's. So uh, that would be negative three squared plus negative three minus six divided by negative three plus three. Uh, we can already see that the denominator is gonna be zero and that would be undefined. Uh, but let's go ahead and see what happens in the numerator as well. This would give us nine minus three minus six over negative three plus three. So it actually turns out that the numerator is zero and the denominator is zero. When you get zero divided by zero, it is called the indeterminate form because on its own, it tells us nothing about the limit of the original function. On the other hand, that indeterminate form does tell us that there might be a common factor between the numerator and denominator. So let's factor the numerator. This limit will be equal to the limit as x approaches negative three of the factored form, which would be x plus three times x minus two over x plus three. So sure enough, we notice we have a common factor in the numerator and the denominator. So the thing is, you can divide out a common factor from the numerator and the denominator without changing the limit. So if I cancel out the x plus threes, the limit will not change. So this is going to equal the limit as x approaches negative three of x minus two. No more denominator. So now there's nothing stopping us from evaluating the limit by direct substitution. If I substitute negative three in for x, I'm going to get negative three minus two, which is negative five. So the limit of this function as x approaches negative three is negative five. Let's take a quick look at the graph before we move on to the next example. Notice that the graph is a line that has a hole at an x value of negative three. So here is negative three right here. And let's just sort of follow that down to the graph. Now, we've learned that it doesn't matter that the function is undefined at the value that x is approaching. What matters is, as the x values approach negative three from the left and from the right, what is the value of the function approaching? What are the y values approaching? And we can see the y values are approaching this value right here, which is at negative five, which is what we had. Before we look at the next example, let's do a quick review concept. How do we factor the sum or difference of two cubes? Well, when you have the difference of two cubes or the sum, it's always gonna factor as a binomial times a trinomial. That means two terms and then three terms. The binomial is going to just come from the cube root of both of these two terms. So if I did the cube root of x to the third power, for example, and the cube root of eight, that's where the binomial is about to come from. So the cube root of x to the third power would just be x 
and we keep the same sign and uh, the cube root of 8 is 2. That's the binomial. Uh, now for the trinomial, I think of it this way. Uh, I'm going to start with the, uh, well, so I know uh, it's a trinomial, so I'm going to have three terms. The first term is going to come from the first term of the binomial. And the last term is going to come from the last term of the binomial. And in both cases, I'm going to square these. So if I take my x and I square it, um, of course, that'll be x squared. If I take 2 or even negative 2 and I square it, I'm going to get a positive 4. And then that just leaves the middle term. The middle term is the product of these two. I'm ignoring the sign for, for now, but if I multiply these together, that'll be 2x. Um, now, what about the sign? It's always going to be the opposite of this. So if this is negative, then this is going to be positive. And in fact, sometimes when this is taught, um, when it comes to the signs, they will say SOAP. S O a P and that stands for same opposite always positive same meaning the same as the original problem so that's a quick review on how you factor the difference of two cubes and it works the same if it was the sum let's find the limit as X approaches 1 of X to the third power minus 1 over X minus 1 first of all will direct substitution work on this problem well, if I substitute 1 in for both of these x's, I'm going to get 1 to the third power minus 1 over 1 minus 1. Very quickly, we see that we're going to get 0 over 0. This is the indeterminate form, and it tells us nothing about the limit of the original problem. However, it does suggest to us that there is likely a common factor between the numerator and the denominator. So let's go ahead and factor. So let's write this as the limit as x approaches 1 of, and we need to factor this numerator. Here's why we did that example of uh, a review of factoring the difference of two cubes. That's what we have here. And we just remembered that this will factor as a binomial times a trinomial. The binomial will just be the cube root of each of these terms. So this will be x minus 1. For the trinomial, I'll, the first term will come from the first term. I'm just going to square this, and I get x squared. The last term comes from the second term. I'm going to square this. And I'm going to get a positive 1. The middle term comes by multiplying these two together. Uh, 1 times x is just x, except for I do the opposite sign, so I'm going to have plus. So that's another example of how you factor the difference of two cubes. Let's bring down our denominator of x minus 1. And we notice right away that we do, in fact, have this common factor of x minus 1. We've learned that when you cancel out a common factor from the numerator and the denominator, it does not change the limit. So we can write this will equal the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared plus x plus 1. 1. Since this function doesn't have a denominator, we can now do direct substitution. So this is going to give us 1 squared plus 1 plus 1. Notice that once we do the substitution, we do not write limit anymore. This is the limit, we just have to simplify. And 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3. So the limit of this function as x approaches 1 is 3. Let's take a quick peek at the graph before we move on. This turns out to be a parabola with a hole at 
x equals 1. So in fact, let's just uh, sort of trace back to the x value of 1. And remember that we're trying to find the limit as x approaches 1. So let's picture it as the x values are approaching 1 from the left and from the right. It is okay that the function is undefined at that x value. What we want to know is what y value is being approached. So we can see that we are approaching a y value of 3, which is exactly what we had. The second technique I wanted to talk to you about is called rationalizing. When trying to find the limit, it is sometimes helpful to rationalize the numerator. This involves multiplying the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the numerator. Let's see if this technique will help us find the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x plus 1 minus 1 over x. First of all, can we do direct substitution? If we substitute 0 for x, that is going to give us the square root of 0 plus 1 minus 1 over 0. Well, that's going to give us just the square root of 1 minus 1 over 0, which is 1 minus 1 over 0, which once again is 0 over 0, the indeterminate form. This will not tell us the limit, so we're going to have to use another technique. Remember that the conjugate of a plus b is a minus b. Let's rationalize the numerator by multiplying by the conjugate of the numerator. So the conjugate will be the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. Basically, when you do the conjugate, you just change the sign of the second term. Of course, we will have to multiply the denominator by the exact same thing. That way, we are really multiplying by 1, which won't change the value of anything. So, when we multiply, we're going to have to do the distributive property twice. So, um, I'm going to multiply by distributing the x plus 1. I'm going to multiply x plus 1 times both of these. And then afterwards, I'm going to take this negative 1, and I'm going to multiply that by both of these. So that's what's about to happen. So this will equal the limit as x approaches 0 of when you multiply a radical times a radical, the radical goes away. Um, so I'm just going to have x plus 1. When you multiply a radical times itself, the radical goes away. Now I'm going to multiply a radical x plus 1 times 1, and that will simply be radical x plus 1. All right, now I'm going to multiply everything by negative 1. Negative 1 times radical x plus 1 is negative square root of x plus 1. And then negative 1 times positive 1 is negative 1. Now, uh, in the denominator, it's a more straightforward distribution. But actually, now that I think about it, I think for now, let's just leave the x uh, in the front. So we're doing x times the square root of x plus 1 plus 1, but let's just leave it factored like this. So as we go to simplify this, notice that the middle terms cancel each other out. This will always happen when you multiply by the conjugate is kind of the point. It's a way of getting rid of the square root part. So what is left? Uh, notice also that here we have a positive 1, and here we have a negative 1. 
So those will also cancel each other out. So these are as good as gone. So the only thing that really survives is the X. All right, nothing cancels that out. So that's the only thing left in the numerator. So this whole thing is going to equal the limit as x approaches 0 of x over x times the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. Right now you're probably noticing that we have a common factor in the numerator and the denominator these x's will cancel each other out. Be careful, we're going to need a 1 as a placeholder after we, afterwards in the numerator. So this will now equal the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. All right, it's time to ask ourselves um, if direct substitution will work now. So uh, let's give it a shot. If we do direct substitution, we're substituting 0 in for x right here. As long as we don't get 0 in the denominator, we will be good. Notice that when you do the substitution, we don't write limit anymore. Uh, the expression that we get will be the limit. We just have to simplify. So if I put 0 right here, I'm going to end up with 0 plus 1, which is just 1. So I'm going to have the square root of 1, and then I'll have plus 1. But that's going to equal 1 over 1 plus 1. The square root of 1 is just 1. And that's going to equal 1 half. So that is the final answer. So uh, going back to the beginning, the limit of this function as x approaches 0 is 1 half. Before we end this video, let's just take a quick look at the graph. And we were trying to find the limit of the function as x approaches 0. And of course, you can see that here is the x value of 0 that we are approaching. And uh, we can see that there, uh, there's a hole at an x value of 0. And that's, that's OK. All that matters is as the x values are approaching 0 from the left and from the right, the value of the function is approaching what y value? And we can see that the y value is right here. I mean, the hole is on the uh, y-axis. But we can see that the y value that we are approaching is right here at 1 half, which is exactly what we got analytically.